Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's a privilege and an honor to be here to speak. Um, thank you. I mean, number one, it's it's the Lord's church, right? Um, as uh, our pastor at our church we go to, he says all the time, he's just a intern and he's been there 32 years. But, you know, it's a it's true. You know, ultimately, this is, this is the Lord's church, right? His body, it's all over the the world, and so thank you for making me feel welcome um, for everyone here. And so, um, yeah, I was here Friday night for the prayer night. It was really refreshing and felt right at home. And as uh, Pastor said, uh, you all have been praying for me, and so a really big thank you to everyone praying. And um, I just want to say thank you very much. And so prayers are heard, right? And we see God moving. And so just deepest, the bottom of my heart, just want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you so much. Give applause for prayer warriors in the house. Let me get my, I got my notes everywhere. Um, But yeah, so we, um, we are from California. We live in Texas now and uh, we moved uh, early 2017, uh, the company I work for, I work for Red Bull. Anybody drink energy drinks in here by chance? Okay. Um, it's okay if you don't drink Red Bull or something else. Uh, somebody the other day was like, I'm sorry, but I drink this other one. I said, it's okay. Because we didn't know Red Bull, they started the whole energy category like, I don't know how many years ago. So I said, you can give praise and glory to Red Bull every time you drink another energy drink. So, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's been 11 years I've worked for Red Bull. It's been great. Um, before that, I worked in water sales as a water salesman. But I grew up in Northern California. And then my dad, when I was turning uh, 19, he got a job at TBN, the Trinity Broadcast Network. And so he was always a TV engineer guy, behind the scenes guy. And so the uh, whole family moved down to Southern California. We've loved it uh, living here, and then the um, Lord led me to The Rock, and um, long story short, right, got married and welcomed into Sandra's family. I joke around with Stephanie, Sandra's daughter, that uh, her mom, her family loved me more than her now, so, which is true sometimes. Um, and Stephanie's like, ah, yeah, don't, don't, don't remind me. Um, <laughs> but no, w- wonderful uh, mother-in-law whole family, just amazing, you know, and can't be more grateful for uh, a better uh, in-laws, as we call them, but family, ultimately. So, um, love you, Sandra. Thank you very much for everything. So, um, <clears throat> if I make you cry, I'm sorry tonight, I might cry. Um, there's tissues everywhere, so you can grab one. But, uh, um, but real quick, uh, let's pray, uh, just so that pray for this real quick, for this, this moment, and for what God's going to do. Um, Father, uh, we just give you thanks for everything that you're doing, you continue to do. And uh, Lord, I ask this morning, this, this early afternoon, that you speak ultimately, and you move. It's your word that changes us. It's your word that strengthens us, Lord. And to this morning, Lord, let your word speak. Let it take deep root in our hearts. Let it water seeds that have already been planted. And Lord, strengthen everyone here tonight to have more confidence in you and your word and what your plans are for each and every person's life, Lord. And I just thank you for what you're doing and you speak here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so yeah, uh, from California, um, just a quick way to introduce, I grew up in Northern California, and so I grew up a uh, San Francisco Giants fan. Is there any Dodger fans in here? It's okay to raise your hand. It's okay. Uh, I was laughing. Uh, I was traveling for work, and there was a Dodger fan, so I sat next to him in the plane. I was laughing. I was wearing my Giants shirt, and so uh, living and working in LA for, I guess, 18, 19 years it was fun because the Giants won three World Series, not to rub it in, but coming every day to work and there was Dodger fans. It was awesome. Um, and so enjoy. I miss going to baseball games, being in Texas for 
five years now. Um, Houston's a few hours away, and so we haven't really been to um, many baseball games, but I always loved every year going to, you know, a Giants-Dodger game at Dodger Stadium, and it was just fun. And Caleb, uh, you know, our cousin that lives out here, and he's always wearing his Dodger stuff. And yeah, we always had fun. But it's, you know, living in Texas, there's quite a few Californians that have moved there. That's a theme, it seems, as of late. A lot of our neighbors are from California. But coming back here for the weekend, I came back, um, planned this trip a while ago with my son, Nolan. We came to the Star Wars celebration, which is basically a, a convention for Star Wars nerds. Um, I'm a big Star Wars fan. I've never been. So we had a blast yesterday. We just went one day out of four, and Bella came. She didn't know much about Star Wars. Now she's like, yeah, it's crazy. All the people dressed up and stuff. I got pictures if you want to see afterward. Um, but driving around, Sandra let me use the car. You know, I'm like, I don't think enough people have left for California. It still seems very crowded here <laughs> compared to Texas where things are a little more spread out. Um, but it was nice to eat at some favorite places, Porto's. Uh, we used to live in Downey. We used to be able to walk to Porto's and loved that apartment. But having three kids and then a fourth one on the way, God used our job to move us out to Texas. Um, but uh, I took Nolan there to Porto's and he, I realized he was two years old. So he doesn't remember much living there or going there. And so he, I got him like the French toast breakfast and the potato balls, which are amazing, right? And he's eating it and he goes, this is the best restaurant ever. And, then, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, this is, this is amazing. So it's been good to eat at some favorite spots and enjoy um, uh, being here in California just for a few days. So it's like our hearts still here. We love everyone, and so family especially, and you, you all as well here in, in church. So, um, But yeah, it's funny living in Texas. It's funny because uh, you know, there's two things in Texas that are really big. It's breakfast tacos. And um, I used to, on the weekends here in California, make my own like tacos. And uh, Stephanie and I, you know, Sandra's daughter, we go back and forth because you know, she's traditional. I got to have everything on the plate and I scoop it up with the tortilla. And I tell her, that's a breakfast taco. And she goes, no, it's not. And I'm like, okay, but it is. But we go back and forth. And Texas is all breakfast tacos everywhere. There's not many breakfast burritos. Um, and then Dr. Pepper is huge there. I love Dr. Pepper. And so that's a big drink. So if you like breakfast tacos and, and Dr. Pepper, you'll feel at home in Texas. Um, but uh yeah, Texans are funny. They're great. They're very hospitable, and God's blessed us. We've moved, uh, let's see, three times altogether there in Texas, and we finally settled down near Austin. Uh, we found an amazing church that we love, and so it's been good to get back in church again. But, um, um, and so, yeah, to share my story, as Pastor said, and some of you know, um, you know, we, we moved. Uh, the, the Jerome family has grown, you know, four kids. They have two boys and two girls uh, and couldn't ask for a better combo. Uh, the boys are 10 and 7. The girls are 5 and 4, soon to be 5 and 5. They both have birthdays in June. So they call it Irish twins, which I guess that's the only Irish you could see in my kids because they all have dark hair. And so um, kids, people look at my kids like, those are your kids? I'm like, yeah, those are my kids. Um, but as you get to know them, you're like, oh, yeah, it's your kids. And so I joke around, there's too much coffee in those jeans, in those Gu Guatemala jeans. And so um, I always say, if we adopt a kid, we got to adopt a redhead because I'm, I'm the only redhead in my family. And then if we adopt a kid to have a redhead, be like, you know, it's my kid, my kid, my kid, and my adopted kid. And, you know, the kid won't believe me until 25 seeing a psychiatrist. Like, he wasn't lying, you know? And so... Um, <laughs> That's the, yeah. So who knows? One day maybe we will. So, um, but yeah, I'm just thankful for family. Um, you know, Lord has blessed uh, me with just an amazing family, and just uh, thankful to the Lord every day for them. And so, but um, being a California boy, and my family um, upbringing was growing up in church. You know, I just grew up in church uh, my whole life. I had parents that met in church. They got, um, they got ma married or met in a little Bible college there in um, near Monterey, California. And they just, you know, I was raised in church. And 
I think back to my childhood and now where my parents, my parents now live in Tennessee with my sister and her husband. Uh, they're pastors, missionaries. They have two uh, kids that they're almost adopting. Um, they got missionary kids in Thailand, so they're blessed there now. And um, I think back to growing up and thinking of what a blessing it was to have parents that gave me the word, that gave me Jesus, right? And in the natural, you know, it's not like a big inheritance going to pass down in the natural. But in the spirit, which is the most important inheritance, I think back, they gave me the best thing they could, and they gave me Jesus. So um, it's good encouragement. Now having kids, now raising them, it's like, oh, you know, it's kind of an eye-opener to think back to what's really important in life, right? And most important thing we can give our family is Jesus and give him a place to grow and get to know, um, get to know him. So I'm grateful for that. And um, I was a homeschooled kid. I, uh, my mom, she was um, a school teacher at a Christian schools, and she, one day the Lord spoke to her and told her, um, as a teacher, she was teaching third grade, I was in third grade, and the Lord told her she needs to homeschool my younger sister and I, and, which is crazy to think, when you think about it now, I didn't think about it as much then, but that's her profession, right? She's paid for kids to show up to a building, and then God told her, take us out and just stay home. And it was all correspondence. Uh, Our school came in a box every year with papers and books, and it was from the state of Illinois, which I've never been to Illinois yet. I've still never been. And so, you know, I graduated at home with books and a cat and a dog, and every year the cat and a dog would switch off teacher's pet, you know? And so I was a little jealous of seeing kids nowadays, they get connected to, you know, homeschool groups and things. We got some neighbors across the street that do homeschooling online. It was, there was no internet then. It was just a book. And so very different upbringing, but thankful for it. And um, so church became everything to me, right? And that was my life was going to church and youth group every Sunday, every Wednesday. And um, it's funny because I remember getting in trouble a couple times, as kids do. Uh, My parents, the best thing they can ground me from, church. I don't recommend it, but it worked, I guess. But uh, I I haven't met anyone yet who's been grounded from church. You know, that's usually the opposite, right? It's you're grounded from everything else, but you're going to church. I was actually grounded from church. I remember that once or twice that happened. And... um, so maybe one day I'll meet someone who was grounded from church too. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, like as I said, my dad got a job in Southern California, started working jobs and getting um, into the work life. But growing up, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so my parents never pushed me to do one thing or the other. They were just like, do what the Lord leads you to do. And um, I never went to college, didn't spend one day in college. Um, I did YWAM, which is Youth of a Mission, like a missionary uh, uh, schools and a group out there all over the world uh, for five months, but came home and just started working full-time job, got into retail, um, got into sales. And so, um, yeah, I used to, I've always used to say, you know, people ask about, you know, your college degree or what you did. And I'm like, I didn't do anything. I just started working full time. I only had one day of not having a job. And that day I, I didn't have a job. I already applied for another job and got another job. Um, so I've always said, I, like, I didn't go to college because I didn't know what I wanted to do in life. But the truth, as I think about it now, is I did know what I wanted to do. I just wanted to be in church and ministry. Um, I never left youth group. You know, I was always involved with youth and just, I was most, I'm a big kid at heart. As I just said, I went to a Star Wars convention and dressed up in a costume. Um, but uh, I realize now, like, no, like I did, I've always known what I want to do. I want to be in ministry, right? Just want to be serving and be uh, in church. And so if you were to ask me what's my life verse or what's really ministered to me over the years, um, it's in Mark 10, 35. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn there, go ahead and turn there real quick. Uh, Mark 10, verse 35. To give it a little context, we're going to skip, we're going to skip ahead and go to verse 
Um, 42, so 1042, you can start at Mark 1042. But the story is, as I'm sure maybe some of you know, a couple of disciples come to Jesus and they say, um, hey, we want to sit on the left and the right. And John, uh, James and John, and you, know, you can imagine 12 guys as competitive as they are, right? Um, who's not competitive, guys, right? We get competitive about the silliest of things. Um, my son's already competitive at seven years old. Dad, I'm going to beat you to the front door. Okay, like, I don't, you know. <laughs> um, but the disciples got a little upset when they heard James and John say that. And they were like, and they started squawking, right? Getting a little like, hey. Um, so this is where Jesus kind of comes in to calm them down in verse 42. And it says, and Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's always stuck with me, a verse where Jesus is like, hey, even the Son of Man, he didn't come to be served, right? As we know, as we read in the Bible, they expected when the Messiah came, he would be exalted there, right, on, on the spot, and just kick the Romans in the jaw, take over the world, right? And Jesus was like, no, 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 no. I didn't come to conquer the Romans. I came to conquer sin, right? So that we can come to God even better. And, but it's, it's a great verse. And I think I really learned this lesson when um, I was working uh, as in a sales job. And if, you, if you're in a sales job, salesmen could be very, very, me, 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 right? It's all about me. You know, I'm the best. I'm the salesman. And, and I left the company I was working at and not in a good way. I got caught up in the talk. I got caught up in the me, me, me mentality. And um, I left the company for another similar company to get a promotion that I wanted. And somehow in my mind, I um, even thought, well, I didn't, they should just give me a promotion here where I'm at they're not, so I'm going to go to a new company. It was, it's so silly when I think about it. It's kind of dumb, you know, like I could have asked and they probably would have said, sure, but I didn't. And so I left kind of uh, grumpy and I got that, the promotion I wanted at another company, but I'm there about five months or so and I realize, yeah, I kind of made a mistake. That wasn't, I wasn't serving. I wasn't have a good servant's heart, right? And this verse came to mind. And long story short, God brought me back to the company I was at, and you know my heart was changing. I was in a good church, hearing the word, and I got the promotion I wanted. And I was then uh, moving in that promotion. It was great. It was amazing how God brought it back, and I was getting paid more than when I left. And then one day they called me and they said, "Hey, we need to see you. Um, come see us upstairs, the owner of the company." And I said, "Okay." I think somehow I knew. Maybe somebody told me that they were going to ask me if I'd be willing to step down to the prior position I was at. And I had a piece in my heart I was, and about it. And so I'm upstairs with the owner of the company, and I kind of knew what they were going to say. And, and um, I think they, and I'm not sure if they said it or not, but I, I just told them my words were, look, I think I've learned my lesson. You know, it's not about getting what's best for me, I said to them, I want what's best for the company. You know, I'm here to serve. And if you feel that I need to do my old position, that that's what's best for the company right now to help it prosper, then I'm all in. Like, you tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. And uh, I remember the owner, he even paused, was like in shock. You know, he even, his words were, no one's ever said that before. And, and I was saying, I appreciate them, right? Like, I'm here to serve. It's not about me. What do you want me to do? I'll do 100%. And I did it. And I was so blessed in, in that. And um, I think this verse has been easy to walk out since then with my work life. Uh, working at Red Bull, I've been promoted 
seven times in 11 years. And um, positions I'm in now, it's usually a college degree position, which I don't have, and even shock some people I worked with. Like, what? You've never been to college? And like, no, I just work hard and I'm here to serve. And so I share that a lot, even in my workplace, when uh, part of my job is to do presentations and share a little bit about myself. I travel through different uh, companies that sell Red Bull, and I get to share that a lot, which is a blessing. Um, but walking it out in my personal life at home, that's another story sometimes, right? Sometimes it's easy to operate it here, but then how do I operate it here? So um, you can ask my wife. I'm not perfect in any way. I'm always learning, right? That's the awesome thing about being a believer is we're always learning. And so it's a scripture, even when I got married, um, that I realized over and over and over again, and especially when you have kids and more kids, you know, I, I joke around, when you get married, you, you realize I'm a little more selfish than I thought, you know, as a single person, everything was mine. Now I have to share, you know, and then you have kids and you're like, I thought I was doing better, but apparently not. You know, my me time gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, parents can agree, right? You know what I'm talking about. And then you have four. It's like, ooh, yeah. It's, uh, somebody one time told me, um, it was a really powerful statement. He says, don't forget, your kids didn't ask to be here. You brought them here. So it's kind of your fault. So I'm like, that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, so yeah, come to serve, not to be served. And it's just been a powerful verse for my life. I thought I'd share that with you as I share my story. Um, and then, you know, um, serving as a young person, uh, being in ministry. You know, my parents used to tell me um, as a young kid, you know, like, pray for your future spouse, who you're going to meet. And at 13, I'm like, ew, gross. You know, girls have cuties. Um, but it was true. And I've seen God move, right? Being in ministry, serving God has blessed me with an amazing wife and gave me the desires of my heart and um, even asked for things that I wanted as a young person. And seeing how God moved and did all that was just amazing and what God did. Um, she's, she's amazing. I have a story where I was 21, hanging out with a friend from church, and he's talking to his girlfriend on the phone. I'm bored. We're supposed to be hanging out. And then I jokingly told him, um, I said to him, like, hey, tell her to find me a girlfriend so I could do this to you, you know, and just having that third wheel moment. And uh, so then I did. I wrote down 10 things I wanted, and I wrote them all out. And then when he, I, he read them to her, I was like, yeah, read it. And um, I don't know whatever happened to the list. I was just trying to remember them. But when I wrote it out and asked, basically asking the Lord for what I wanted in that future spouse, it stuck with me over the years, and God helped me be patient and wait. And um, there was 10 things. I'll share them with you. That they're kind of funny and also good. But uh, I said, one, she's got to love Jesus more than me. More than me. She, like, Jesus has got to be number one. It was something my parents always told me. Um, whoever you meet, whoever you marry, that person's got to be number one, right? And that God's number one first. Um, serving in church, a worshiper, enjoy ministry with kids. Um, she's got to want to have kids. That worked out pretty good. Um, like sports. So it's funny because she grew up Dodger family. She's been like, now she's a full on Giants fan. So that says a lot. Um, she just pushed the Dodgers aside. Um, enjoy traveling. She's traveled with me all over. Have a sense of humor. Um, absolutely beautiful, which she is. I couldn't remember the last one, but I think it had something to do with Star Wars, and she had to love Star Wars. So, and she does. Like we, we've actually, uh, there's like a Star Wars podcast that I subscribe to, and we've actually been guest host on their podcast. So that says a lot um, about her going all in, and she's been a blessing, and she absolutely uh, loves the Lord, and she's actually uh, finished. You know, um, Foursquare Bible College. So she's graduated from that. You know, she essentially is an ordained minister. And so God's got giftings in her that God's still doing in her. And she's been a blessing. It's all Sandra's uh, blessing as well. So thank you, Sandra, for <laughs> a wonderful wife. Um, but, uh, you know, in Matthew 7, 7, I'll read this to you. You don't have to turn there. But, you know, the Lord says, ask, it'll be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, it'll be opened for you. For anyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. 
Or which of you, if a son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good gifts to those who ask him? In Mark eleven twenty four says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, this is Jesus talking, believe you received it, it's yours. So walking it out, seeing that, right? That's promises of God in the word. Um, so that was, that's our family. You know, we were involved in church, ministry. The family was growing. And to share my story with you all, somewhere along the way, I just got caught up in work, caught up in all the busyness, uh, still serving in ministry before we moved to Texas. But even before we left for Texas, somewhere, my zeal, my hunger for God, the hunger for word, being in the word, it started to fade away. Um, and can't pinpoint when or where, but it can happen to anyone, right? And, and it was something that happens in our lives, even just our normal good we're walking in the Lord strong. We can have our moments where we come down. But moving to Texas really made it easy just to really disconnect. And we uh, were visiting churches and churches. Stephanie was really patient with me. Um, we lived near Dallas. We were going to church, but I, just, I became a casual churchgoer um, and just busy working, busy working, being just busy dad, being a, uh, just doing that stuff. And you know, Satan, you know, he's got three things he wants to do, right? He wants to steal, kill, and destroy us. And he's got one mission. That's his only mission in life, right? And, you know, he wants to steal from us, number one, his ultimate goal is to steal us from him, right? He wants us to spend eternity apart from God. And if you can't do that, he wants to kill the calling of God that's on your life, right? And he wants to stop you from being a blessing to people, to minister his love to people. Um, and so that's kind of what I was giving into. I was giving into that. And, you know, First Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And that's what I was basically doing for a few years, was just letting him distract me, um, be apart from God and just not as connected to him as I should be. Then December 20th, um, 2020, December 2020, you know, but God was still blessing us. Um, no matter what, like uh, pastor was saying that even when we're unfaithful, he's still being faithful, right? He's faithful to us. We got blessed with a brand new home, our first home we've ever had there in uh, near Austin, and um, God's still blessing us through it. And December 2020, I had a spot on my leg that didn't look good. It was black. And um, finally, you know, and I never went to the doctor. I was just healthy as can be. And perfect health, 40 years old. You know, you think, ah, I'm fine, right? It's a thing that guys sometimes we do. Um, we don't slow down to go to doctors or get checked to know what to pray for or what to believe for. And I go to the skin doctor, the dermatologist, and I'm sitting in the waiting room. And this black spot was flat. Then it started bubbling up. It was about that big. And I'm seeing pictures on the wall. They got pictures of what skin cancer looks like. And I'm thinking, uh-oh, that looks like my leg. That's not good. And sure enough, the doctor comes in. He gets very alarmed and uh, they cut it off to send it to the lab to test it to see what it is. Sure enough, it is melanoma skin cancer. And skin cancer, as you read about it and know about it, my dad actually had it a few years prior on his arm and his face. Everything got removed. He's, he's fine and he's totally healthy. Um, but it's uh, cancer that's becoming more prevalent as of late. Um, since I've had it, I've seen people, talk to people, at least encourage people to go see a dermatologist to see early. It can happen any skin type. I'm definitely, a, uh, I forget what the word is, but you know, fair skin, redhead, the sun is not my friend, right? <laughs> so uh, 
But skin cancer, it's not good. It very, very quickly spreads through lymph nodes, uh, your filters in your blood. And so I, I go through surgery. They, everything happens so fast. I knew in the very beginning, this is going to be a spiritual fight, not natural, right? Um, but I was still not in a spiritual place that I should be. And I just went through the motions, went to the doctors, surgery removed about a softball size off my leg. It did spread to a primary lymph node. It had progressed far enough here in my upper leg. They remove lymph nodes. The process is to remove as much as they can, and then they test it, and they think they got it all. Um, they put me on what's called immunotherapy. It's a new treatment for uh, skin cancer. It's a complete opposite of chemo. Chemo basically zaps you and just, it's not good, right? The radiation. Immunotherapy is a new, new technology to kind of ramp up your immune system. It's an IV. Every three weeks you go get, you know, the, uh, through IV, this treatment. I started, they started me on that. I'm going through that every three weeks. I'm there at the cancer center. It's crazy to think, you know, I was perfectly healthy, totally fine, and now it's boom, 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 so fast. And did that for about three months, and then um, I felt uh, a lump here on my side. And I'm like, huh, it's kind of small. I brought it to the doctor's attention, and we did a CT scan. Um, and then sure enough, they ran a sample on, there's another one here on the left at my belt line. It's cancer. It, they hadn't got it all. It had gone deeper than what they had expected. So they switched me to another immunotherapy. And so I start that treatment every three weeks, going through that, going through that. You all are praying for me. Um, and all of last year, 2021, I was like, okay, God, you know, we got to find a good church to go and get, be with believers of, you know, believe in faith, believe in healing. And around November, um, our neighbor across the street, who we knew were believers, um, they were ministers at a church, but they were visiting uh, the church we're at now in Austin. I mean, our first Sunday there, it was like, wow, this is where God wants us to be. Um, so we found this amazing church where it was just like the presence of God was so strong. It was like, finally, we found a good place to come to, you know, charge our faith, be with other believers of like faith. And um, I'm still getting this immunotherapy. They stop at the beginning of December, this last December. And so they stop it to run another scan at the end of the month to see if it's working. And so Christmas, um, I started feeling a little sick Christmas weekend, like felt off. Of course, your first thought, is it COVID? Of course, I go to urgent care. That's the only test they want to give you nowadays. I'm negative for COVID. They prescribe antibiotics. And I'm feeling these weird symptoms, feeling like body aches and, and strained. It's not COVID. And uh, some good friends of ours that used to live in California, um, he was my best man. Their daughter was our flower girl at our wedding. Uh, they moved as well a few times. They were at The Rock with us as well. But they were in Michigan. But now they're in Plano, Texas, which is about a good three, four-hour drive. And on New Year's weekend, we go visit, visit them. And they came uh, to Texas with um, a real strong... Um, What's the word? Just a, felt the calling to really reconnect and even connect with people on a covenant level, meaning like we're here to connect with you. And um, this good friend of mine, he has been standing in the gap for me. He, like he's committed to me to, I'm standing in the gap for you, Mark. I'm praying for you. And uh, his wife shared with Stephanie, he's been up all night praying and praying and it's just bless me and still a blessing to think he's there and to have a friend like that is just amazing. And I left that weekend having other symptoms. My appetite started fading. I started not eating as much. And um, I left that weekend. I told Stephanie, I was like, I was like, you know what? I'm tired of messing around. It's time to get serious. And, you know, I was like, first thing first, we're tithers. Like, I'm 100%. Like, I'm the one doing most of the finances in the family. And we're not tithing on net. We're tithing on gross. And it was just January 1st. That was, like, the first step for us to get back on track. And 
I got tested right away with uh, walking that out. Um, you know, did the first check is easy. You know, the check you get every two weeks, and then every year I get a bonus check. And unfortunately, the bonus check gets taxed a little heavier than your normal, you know, check. And so I was blessed with a bonus check that was like 50% bigger than the prior year. And I hesitated for just for a second. And then I was like, no, 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 gross. Like, we're writing that check. And it felt so good just to be like, okay, God, I'm trusting you again. Malachi 3, I know what it says. God's like, stop robbing me. I want to bless you, right? I want to bless your socks off. And so we did that. And then as time progressed, they, um, they run the tests of, to see where I'm at. So as I said, they stopped the treatment and they ran the CT scan. The cancer, unfortunately, had not shrunk. It had doubled in size. It was still here in my waistline. No new locations, the doctor's report said, but now they got to do something different. Um, so they took me off that immunotherapy, and then they prescribed these pills I take twice a day. Um, they're pills that go in and attack a mutation in the cancer. They have good success with them. They don't use them right away, as they say, because usually long-term, they're not good. So I received that first week of the year of 2020. Um, and then the symptoms I start feeling is crazy. I start having fatigue. Uh, my muscles are getting weak. The loss of appetite, as I said, I start losing weight. And I start experiencing weight loss, nausea, joint pain. My knees had basically like arthritis. It was crazy at 42 years old. Irritability, uh, my memory loss. I started, as soon as they gave me the pills that third week of January, I started throwing up. Um, I couldn't hold anything down in the morning. I just throw up water. I'm getting worse and worse. My blood pressure starts coming down. Um, my pulse rate was crazy. I bought one of those finger things for the oxygen and the I'm sure if you go to the doctor, you know what that is. I bought one on Amazon. I'd walk to the restroom, which is right next to our room. I'd come back, and my pulse rate would be like 130, 135. I couldn't go upstairs that entire like, first couple of months of the year. I'd just be out of breath. I was just completely out of breath. Every day I was getting worse. I was dehydrated. Um, and it's the end of, the end of January, so this is all happening in like a month or so. I, I try taking those pills for four days, and that's it. I was like, I can't, like I was just a mess. And up until this point, I'd always gone to the doctor myself, just kind of doing it on my own. And um, February 1st, Stephanie had to drive me because I was just a mess. It was an emergency visit to go to the cancer center. She drops me off and she, my youngest daughter's not in school and kids can't come in, so they have to go to breakfast and wait and they'll come pick me up. As I'm sitting in the hotel, uh, the, hotel the, the doctor's office waiting room, I started feeling, okay, this oh, strange feeling, like I was going to throw up or something. And I go to the restroom. As I'm hanging up my sweater on uh, the door in the handicap stall, I pass out. And I wake up like in the corner. Thank God I didn't hit my head. It's him protecting me. But my foot is throbbing. And I'm like, I've never broken anything in my life, but that must be a broken feeling. And sure enough, it was. I hobble back to the lobby. And I don't even ask for help. I'm just sitting there and waiting. I start texting Stephanie like, I think I passed out. OK, I think I broke my foot. And I'm like, OK, this is pretty serious. <laughs> and. I finally raised my hand, asked for help, and then all the nurses rush. I was like five or six. A uh, young lady calls uh, Stephanie and almost crying. I guess I looked pretty bad. Um, and so they, they hydrate me. I was dehydrated. So the doctor says, it's possible I'm probably having a side effect from the immunotherapy treatments I got last year. What can happen is your adrenal glands which sit on your kidneys, they produce the hormones for your body, they produce the steroids for your body. Um, they do a lot for your body, a lot more than you know. Um, not a big anatomy guy, um, but didn't really know what they were until now. Um, so they run a test to see if that is the case. The test comes back and um, the doctor says, no, that's not it, but I hope you get better. I'm like, that's basically it. So I start seeing... Uh, primary doctor, I see a cardiologist trying to figure out what is going on. They send me to another specialist. 
Nobody can say what's going on. Uh, I laugh, the, the cardiologist, the heart doctor, they're looking at my blood work. The meanwhile, I'm losing 20 pounds, 30 pounds. When it's all said and done, I lost 40 pounds, went from basically 200 to 160, all within two months. And the cardiologist, it's funny because he says, um, I don't normally say this, but you need to eat more red meat. Um, and he said, I'm thinking, he'd probably never say that, right? You know, usually the cardiologist is going to tell you, stop eating meat. Um, but the week after I passed out, Sandra, awesome, awesome woman of God with favor at her job, she comes. She just comes. And she's with us for three and a half weeks during all this. And having her there was a blessing to help Stephanie because Stephanie was at every doctor's appointment after that. And the hero of the story, really, it's the Lord, but it's Stephanie as I finish wrapping it up. Um, so it didn't sit right with Stephanie. None of the doctors know what's going on. We don't have an answer, right? Um, they're just like, I hope you get better so we can give you, start you on treatment pills. I'm not taking any treatment pills during that time. And um, Sandra and Stephanie are trying to feed me. I'm in bed, my job, I have favor of them, praise God. I'm just working from home in bed. Uh, I got so many teas and healthy drinks. And as Sandra will, can tell you, it was hard to feed me. I just, I had no appetite. It was crazy. It was like just, just eating grass or something. And I think at one point, Sandra did give me some beet drink that did taste like grass, but I'm just teasing you. Uh, <laughs> it was grass. Um, saltine crackers, like anything. And then every morning I was nauseous. I guess I know what it's like to be pregnant to some degree. Um, I was just throwing up. I couldn't eat or drink anything in the morning. Um, this is all going on for almost two months. And um, Stephanie finally is like, you know what? Something's not right. So she looks up online um, the test they ran early in the month to see what is adrenal insufficiency. And so they had tested the cortisol, which is the steroid that your body produces. You should have a range of 10 to 50, it says online. The test, she tells me, look it up. I look it up. The test they ran, I scored a six, a 6.1. So it, it was the Holy Spirit speaking to her to tell her that's the problem, which the doctors weren't saying. And Finally, we're at the doctor's, we're seeing the main doctor, and she starts telling him, hey, I went online, I saw this, this is what I saw, and I know you ran the test. And he's like, yeah, yeah, we ran that test. And she goes, well, in a nice way, she said, you're wrong, that is the problem. And he's like, I don't have the results in front of me, I can't remember what the, the levels were on this and that, and she rattled them off, 6.0, 6.1. And he was like, oh, uh, okay. Um, he was taken aback by it. And um, he says, well, let's run another test, a more of a deep dive. It takes three days to order it. They did. So they ordered that test. And three days later, I'm there. They take a baseline blood test. And then they administered a very small steroid, uh, which is what could be missing. That's what they're testing for. Then they ran blood three more times after to see if that's uh, how your body reacts. The next day was my birthday, February 25th. And um, they had a cake and everything waiting for me to come out of my room. I was in bed, but then I, was, I started feeling hungry. So I came out, and I'm not one. I can't eat dessert before I eat my food. I like to save it for the end. I like dessert. Um, and so I made chicken and rice, and I just whipped a, a dinner together. I hadn't cooked in, for I don't know how long. And I ate the biggest meal I had. We celebrated. Uh, two days later was Sunday. We go to church, but about 10 minutes before it's ending, I'm like, uh-oh, that feeling is coming back. It's not, I'm not feeling good. And I'm back in bed again, and it's Monday, February 28th, March 1st. We're going to see the doctor at 8 a.m. and hopefully get those test results to know if this is the problem. And Monday, they ordered an emergency CT scan because um, I was complaining about the pain I was having pain from the cancer and I couldn't sleep. I was like, something's wrong. I just, and so he's like, let's run a CT scan to see what's going on. Um, the last one I had was beginning of January. So in the office, getting the CT scan, I'm sitting in the chair waiting to get called. And I told Stephanie, I was like, something's wrong. 
she gets up to ask for a wheelchair. And I was so weak, I could hardly walk. And um, I passed out in the chair. And uh, Stephanie describing it to me um, with tears in her eyes. My eyes were wide open, my eyes were dilated, and I was just lifeless in the chair. And scary thing to see anyone you love in that kind of condition. Um, she called for help. A young lady there who was, you know, there was no doctors at that office, but the young lady who was a paramedic, I think, assessed the situation, helped calm her down. And it was like, I think he just passed out, which I had. I woke up, they laid me down, because that's a side effect of um, adrenal glands being insufficient, is your blood, can't, your blood pressure can't keep up. So uh, I'm fine. I get home. I'm in a wheelchair. And my foot, which was broken, they put a boot on it. I was healed within like three weeks, four weeks. So I was out of a wheelchair, but now I'm back in a wheelchair again. I'm like, this is not right. Um, and the other miracle that happened that night before we saw the doctor March 1st, um, I was so dehydrated, it was, but I'd have to get up and use the restroom like all the time. I, that, I went to the restroom, which is right next to our room. And um, I'm in the, the little toilet stall, and I, I stand up, and I yelled out. It's like almost midnight, and I'm like, babe. And she wakes up, and she sees me, and I don't remember this, but I slowly went down to the ground. I passed out again. And um, I was the one being stubborn, saying, we'll just wait to go to the doctor's on uh, next morning. Of course, Stephanie and Sandra are like, just call 911. I'm like, no, I think let's just wait till we go. Um, I think we'll know tomorrow what's going on. But that was a miracle because tile floor, I don't remember that falling down. That was God. I really believe that was his angels. She said, I went down slowly and I woke up like in that crime scene position and like my head, I'm like, is my head okay? Thank God it was. And I was totally fine. No broken foot again. Um, uh, but the next morning, I'm in a wheelchair. We go back in to the doctor's office, seeing the doctor. Um, I'm a mess. Like, I'm a complete mess. It's bad. And Stephanie's telling him everything that happened. And uh, the doctor still is, like, not confident. The test results didn't come back. It actually wouldn't come back until that Friday. Um, and Stephanie had to tell him, look, because I think I'd messaged them, I was feeling better. And she was like, no, he was better because you gave him that little steroid test, which is what my body was missing. Um, and then he, it clicked, like, oh, okay. So I think you're right. But he didn't say that, but, you know, she was right, and God had spoken through her. So they sent me downstairs to get the steroid IV that I needed, the boost. Um, and then there's little steroid pills I got to take three times a day. But as soon as I got the medicine I needed, uh, which, unfortunately, the prior medicine had messed me up. Now this is just what's fixing it, right? Um, I was instantly better. I started eating again. I was so much better. Um, all those symptoms I was experiencing were, like, instantly gone. And I was pretty skinny and um, lost so much weight, but then I have gained back about 15, 16 pounds now. So now... Uh, the silver lining is I've, I did want to lose weight, you know, and as you get older, your metabolism slows down. So now I'm at that perfect weight where I'm like, okay, okay, God, you know, I, I need to start working out no more. Um, so before they sent me downstairs for the medicine I needed, the steroid, um, he looked at those CT scan results. Two months had gone by since my last scan, and I'd only taken me that medicine for like three days, three and a half. And he's looking at it, and he's like, huh. And he's looking at it, he's like, this is interesting. Um, I'm like, well, basically the cancer was shrinking. And the main one was actually dying in the center. Um, so that was a faith boost. It was like, praise God. And the doctor says, uh, well, maybe that medicine you took for three days. And I'm just like, I smirked. I'm like, no, no. like, <laughs> It's God. Um, so... Got the medicine I needed. I, I thank Stephanie almost every, every day. Just be like, thank you for saving my life. Thank you, Lord. You know, I forgot to mention your pastor came uh, before all the, uh, the end of that um, and prayed um, for us about, I think it was the middle of February, was it? Yeah. And so he came and prayed over us. And that was so timely to pray and um, 
you know, after he prayed for me and um, he asked, you know, was there anything I want prayer for? I was like, pray for Stephanie, pray for her. Um, and so thank God, you know, it's been several months now, but it's, there was more anxiety than I realized, right? And it was amazing to see God sp- speak through her. And I wouldn't be here, right? Doctors don't have the solutions. We know God can use doctors, that's for sure, right? To, and, but it's a reminder we need to pray that, you know, God's uh, giving those doctors wisdom. And sometimes we need to tell the doctors what the wisdom is that we need. Um, and so it was just, <sighs> next to my bed, I still have uh, that last night when I passed out, I, I told Stephanie, go grab me the Home Depot bucket. And I, you know, I, I peed in that, that couple nights. Um, so I still have next to my bed, I don't want to forget what God's done, the miracle that he's working. Um, I got the crutches, I got the boot. I got the Home Depot bucket. Don't worry, there's no pee in it. Um, but I got the saltine crackers. I got the knee warmers. And just thankful to God, that first night after I got the medicine I needed, I couldn't sleep that whole night. And um, that night, I just saw, as I closed my eyes, um, me sharing my testimony, uh, like I'm doing now. And, um, and I was able to share, even at my, our new church uh, a few weeks ago, this testimony of what God's doing. And I with tears in my eyes that night, I, I told the Lord, I was like, Lord, realizing, like, I don't want man or the doctors to have the glory. I want you to have the glory in all this. And you're already doing it. You're already getting the glory for what you can do. And... Um, that was my prayer. I was like, Lord, if you want me to share this testimony, I'll do it. And to help encourage people to um, continue to put their trust in him, to seek after him. And we're not out of it yet. Um, but no matter what, as I'm learning, as I'm spending time in the word, and that's the other part of this awesome testimony. As I shared, I wasn't in the word. I wasn't seeking God like I should. Um, it was my mom that kind of... Because I was telling her when I, that first week of March was amazing. It was like my spirit was so alive. Um, I was fasting and didn't know I was fasting. I've never done like a big fast or like a 40-day fast. Um, It wasn't a fast that I volunteered for. Um, But I've never had my spirit, man, my Holy Spirit was just talking to me and quickening my spirit of scriptures and things and just coming alive. As I'm laying in bed at night, I was just in the Word on my phone and taking notes, um, scriptures for our family, for loved ones, and it was just amazing. And just seeing, and then my hunger for God has come, it's, it's back, right? I'm just back in the Word. I, get, I wake up early, 5 or 5.30 to get that extra half hour or an hour before the kids wake up for school. And it's been such a blessing to be, as I was talking to an old friend of mine, um, sharing this story, you know, he told me, um, he goes, well, Mark, it just, you're back where you were when I first met you 20 years ago, um, just on fire for the Lord, getting back in his presence again, and just loving on him, and growing in him, and um, growing as a husband, as a father, um, to my kids, and so I'm just thankful for that, and um, his faithfulness. You know, Friday night, um, it was said, you know, God is faithful. You know, we say a lot of times God is good, but that's been in my spirit a lot now is God is faithful. And he has no choice but to be faithful to his word. He can't do anything opposite. You know, in him, there's no doubt. There's no unbelief. Um, but in him is just his word. It's yes. It's amen. His promises are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if we're in the word, right, if we're in his presence, that's what gives him the opportunity to move in our lives. So um, we're not out of it yet. We still, as I know, you know, the doctor's report hasn't come back like you're cancer free yet, but I know God's word says I am. And so coming out of that, that's what the pastor shared this t-shirt um, at the cancer center, they have shirts that say cancer sucks. And the staff wear these shirts that say cancer sucks. There's other cancer centers that say other things. Um, not very full of faith, right? And I'm like, kind of like, 
yeah, I already know cancer sucks. I don't want to be here, you know? So coming out, it had been on my heart for a while. And so as I was recovering in March, I went online and ordered all these shirts. And I was like, what was alive in my spirit was Isaiah 53, that we know by his stripes we're healed, right? By his wounds, we, he took it all. And on the cross, he defeated everything, right? When Jesus said, it's finished, meaning everything, right? Our sins, he took care of everything in that moment. He rose again in three days. And so I made it very Christian-y. I wanted it big and bold. Um, you know, it's Isaiah 53, 4 through 5. And um, I, wear this, I wear this shirt now every time I go to the cancer center and just pray and ask God for an opportunity if someone asks. The first time, though, I chickened out. I pulled a Peter. I was telling Pastor about that earlier, and we were talking. And I was like, ugh, like, okay, I'm sorry, Lord. Like, I'm wearing this shirt. So now when I go, I go with more purpose. The sad thing is, as I've gotten better, instead of like twice a week and every other week, now I got to go back in six weeks. And I'm like, kind of like disappointed. I'm like, no, I want to go and wear the shirt. I want to pray for somebody. I want to do something. Um, but God has just been amazing in seeing what he's doing. Um, I go this, this week, I go to uh, Houston for like a second opinion, to a cancer center there. Uh, they're going to run scans there in Austin. They'll run scans in two weeks. So uh, my confidence in the Lord has been growing as I've been in the Word and listening to teaching on healing. Um, doesn't matter what the doctor's report says. I got God's report, right? Um, if you remember from the 90s, there was a song that uh, was sung, Ron Connolly, you know, whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. So I got that back in my iPhone again. I, I listened to that once in a while. Um, but it's so true, right? It doesn't matter what report we have. Um, it could be a negative report, finances, or anything else, but God's report is what we stand on, right? And what we believe on. Um, Proverbs 3, 5, and 8. Uh, I'll share this one with you as uh, time's getting kind of low, but it says, trust in the Lord of all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. And then verse, verse 1 in that same chapter of Proverbs 3, it says, don't forget my teachings, the word, it's length of days and years of life, and peace will be added to you. In the very beginning, the doctor's report said, we have you on a five-year plan. I'm like, that's great. What's after five years? Um, you know, uh, but God's report says days, years, life, and peace will be added to you. And as a family, we're standing on that. My wife, Stephanie, she was having a heart-to-heart -heart with our oldest son, Elliot, who's not here, um, who's asking a lot of questions about what's going on with me. And uh, she gave him a really good uh, analogy. That our family, we're running a marathon right now. And if you're a marathon runner, if you run a marathon, in the middle of it is when you want to give up right? It's tough. You're feeling tired. And he could relate to that. Him and I ran a 5K last Thanksgiving, and I don't like running at all. Running is not fun. Um, and, uh, and he was like, yeah, and like, that's when you want to give up is in the middle, but that's when you need to keep pushing. You got to keep going and don't give up. Hebrews um, 10, 23. This is a verse that's been alive in me and I've just been really just reading it and reading it over and over. It's on my phone cover. But it says in the Amplified, let us seize and hold tightly the confession of our hope. What's our hope? Our hope is our faith, right? It, without wavering. For he who promised is reliable and trustworthy and faithful to his word. Again, there's God's faithfulness, right? Um, and Isaiah 53 if you want to turn there, let's read it together. Um, I'll get to closing with this. If I could turn there with one hand. <laughs> Here we go. Isaiah 53. Um, and this is so good. You know, we just finished the Easter season, what, a couple months ago? And um, 
And, you know, every year, you know, Easter, we, we remind ourselves the story of Jesus and what he did for us. But this chapter, it was Stephanie that read it to me. And this is one I keep reading, and it just keeps speaking to me. And I'll share this with you. I'm do the same for you. But in verse 53, verse 1, it says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root on the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, by his stripes, were healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet he was, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, Yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Go down to verse 10. It says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He, was put, he has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. That's us. He shall bear their iniquities. Um, as I've been studying the word and just feeding my faith and growing my faith and, and just knowing that he is our healer, it's right here in Isaiah 53 before it even happened, right? Right? talks about, you know, we, it's really easy as believers to know we have salvation, right? We come to him, confess our sins. We know we got a place in heaven, right? But a lot of times we fail realizing it's the same for our healing, right? How often do we come to him and ask him for forgiveness? Like a lot, right? You know, it's a very routine, like, oh, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for this. Forgive me for that. But we forget at the same time Jesus bore all of our pain, all of our grief, depression, anything, everything that this world, the enemy has done, he took it all. And it's all there for us. And we can walk in that same faith. We can walk in the same believing that he's our healer. He gives us peace of mind, um, our salvation, everything, right? Our sins are forgiven. It's all there. It's all part of we see it, Jesus doing it in the Bible, making people whole. And um, just want to encourage everyone, as, as the Lord's been encouraging me, the same for you. Whatever situation's going on in your lives, that God knows that he knows it. Just go to him, right? Uh, run to him. He's, he will take care of us. He's faithful. Amen? Amen? But we have to seize it, as Hebrews 10 says, Seize and hold tightly, meaning we got to grab it. Sometimes we got to hold on to it and grab it and know, no, 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 enemy. This is what God has promised. We got to remind ourselves. As it says in Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not his benefits. Why? Because it's easy to forget, right? We forget. And then in Psalms 103, he lists them, right? He forgives all of our sins. He heals all of our diseases. Those are the benefits of walking with God. And it's ours. It's ours. Confidence. In confidence, we know that is what God has for us. Amen.